Hello everyone, so this is The Body Snatchers by John Dixon Carr, and you'll soon realise that it's not my narration. In fact, this is an old, um, old-time old radio mystery theatre production from 1942. Now, you can actually download this yourself as an MP3, but I thought it might be convenient, and it might actually add to the content of the channel. But as you know, I always experiment with things, so if this doesn't work and people don't like it, we won't do it again. But let me see. Tell me in your comments what you think about me doing this. So um, I have taken this file and I've cleaned it up a little bit. Um, but pretty much it is as it was. I hope you find it germane to the channel and I uh, hope you enjoy. Let me know if you do. Let me know if you don't. And I will modify my behavior based on an aggregate of the comments. For suspense, tonight we present The Body Snatchers by John Dixon Carr. Beware of the body snatcher who prowls after dark. Beware of the graves he robs. Beware of the murders he commits to provide new corpses for the doctors. Up to the year 1832, the body snatchers terrorized England. According to the law, only four bodies a year could legally be supplied to the surgeons for anatomical study. And even these were a monopoly granted to the Barbers and Surgeons Company of London. But the study of surgery had to go on. In hundreds of medical schools all over England, perfectly reputable doctors were compelled to buy bodies and ask no questions. In 1828, burst the scandal of Burke and Hare, who found grave robbing too slow and murdered 16 persons in order to supply Dr. Knox of Edinburgh. And so, out of basic good purpose, sprang the evil of... The Body Snatcher. Turn back the clock now to a cold night just 110 years ago. Look into the brick kitchen of a house on Wandsworth Common, not far from London. There in the light of a tallow dip sits old Mother Slade in her draggled bonnet. What's up keeping them? Two hours. Two mortal hours by the Dutch clock. And they're not here yet. Mother Slade. In the graveyard, not half a mile off. And once I thought I heard church bells ring. And once... Mother Slade, did you call? No, my girl, I did not call. But I thought I... And what are you doing up at this hour, my girl? I was only locking up, Mother Slade. Ain't it enough to have taken you over from a good-for-nothing mother not worth the gunpowder to blow her up? Please, Mother Slade. And given you a good home and brought you up practically like a lady... With only the housework to do. I'm sorry, Mother Slade. Only I wish you wouldn't talk like that about my own mother. And what do you do, Peggy Lester? You stop up until this hour. You mislay me snuff box 20 times a day. I was only going to say I thought I heard a horse and cart in the lane. In our lane? Yes, Mother Slade. There it is now. Yes. Easy, my dears. Drive easy with the merchandise. The doctors don't like it if you bump the merchandise. Merchandise, Mother Slade? What's that? I'll tell you what it is, my girl. I didn't mean anything, Mother Slade. It's your Uncle Matt and your cousin Robert coming home from their business. That's what it is. You hear that, Piggy Lister? I didn't mislay your snuff box. It's on the table. And if you don't want me to take my fingernails to you instead of a strap, you get on up to bed this minute, do you hear? Yes, Mother Slade. I'm a-coming, my dears. Don't be impatient. I'm a-coming. Nasty dim light this candle gives. Oh, old Mother Slade has got the rheumatic so cruel she can hardly move. Just pull back the bar. Open the door. Well, Matt, did you get it? Did we get it? Strike my blind, but that's a good one, ain't it, Rob? Stow the gab, cord you get. 
Get inside and close the door. They ain't after you. Ain't they? Can't you hear anything? I thought I heard church bells. More like a perishing funeral bell, if you ask me. Take it easy, Rob. Take it easy. We've shaken them off. Have we? I wish I was as certain as some people. The spades and the sack is still in the cart. Let them stay. Who's a coming to find them? Then you didn't get it after all, you thick skull pair Now, don't you start a blaming us. Now, you shut your potato trap, Mother Slade, or that'll make you shut it. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. We was too quick, that's what. The girl was only buried this afternoon. The sooner the better, my dear. What's the good of the merchandise if it ain't fresh, eh? You hold your noise and listen. We left the horse and cart outside like we always do. We creeps up to the lich gate of the churchyard. Walk softly, Matt. Walk softly, Rob. In your oily beaver hats and neck claws. Under the starlight and the white frosted elm. Take care of the graves, too. Spring guns may be set in some of them to protect the dead from marauders. And if the coffin is one of those new iron ones, all your labor will be in vain. Open the gates softly. Can't make such a bloody row with them shovels. I can't help it. I'm loaded down with all this stuff. Oh, and who'll do all the work when we do get there? I will. Matt. I. Listen. I can't hear nothing except your teeth are chattering. Matt, there's other people besides us in this here churchyard. Aye, two or three hundred deaders. But they won't bother us. I means living people. Don't talk so. Somebody's got a dark lantern. I seen it flash past the gravestones. Oh? Where? Can't you see it there? It's a coming straight toward us. Yes, I see him. Come on. They've seen us, Matt. Stop, Let him have it, lad. He's got the rope. Down behind the gravestones. Right, stand. They can't shoot through stone. Matt, it says here, sacred to the memory it's of... It's the a... girl's relatives. They've been watching her grave. Oh, struth. If only I had me barkers. First time in two years I've gone without a brace of pistols, and this happens. But you ain't got your barkers, Matt Patterson. I got what's just as good. Give me a shovel. What are you going to do? Charge them. This year shovel's got a nice edge. Are you daft? They'll have to take time out to reload, won't they? Hear that? Somebody started the bill. That'll bring down every peeler within a mile. If you want a tithing ticket and a neck in, your, in a rope, stop where you are. But if you don't want to get scragged before your time, follow me. That's all there is to it, Mother Slade. We went out by the gate and blow me if they could stop us. You perishing numbskulls. Did they recognize you? No. We had our neckerchiefs around our eyes. And did you do it? I don't know. There's blood on the shovel. No, that ain't, Mother Slade. I wiped it off. Anyway, we're here. What I want now is a Christian fire to sit by and a drop of spirits to warm my stomach. There's no spirits in the house, Matt Patterson. Don't you lie to me, you ugly man. Let go, go me hand, Matt Patterson. I'm warning you. You better let him go, Matt. There's no spirits. Only half a loaf of bread. Don't I know it. I haven't tasted a drop of gin all day. Black dog's on me back. Well? Ark at what I say. The doctor was promised a corp tonight. All right, dearie, he gets a corp tonight. Oh, there's that funeral bell again. What's the clock, old hag? Come on, spit it out. A nice young corp without any trouble or bother. Aye. What about young Peggy upstairs? Strike me blind. What about it, eh? You'd have to be mighty careful. Why? 
You'd have to smother her with a pillow while I sit on her legs. That's what Burke and Eyre done up in Edinburgh. Then you don't leave any marks on them. Yeah. See? Here, Arthur, take weight. What? If the doctors see they've been polished off, just plain murdered, they won't have nothing to do with it. These ways, they don't like it. Like it or not, dearie, they all do. Who's buying the beef tonight? Dr. George Arnold. Him? The young fella out Fulham Way? That's the man, dearie. But I thought he was too pious and holy to play. That's what Dr. Arnold thought, too, till they started putting the screws on him at Bart's College. No corp, they said to him. No lecture. No lecture, no students. They all comes to it, dearie, sooner or later. What beats me is why they got to have these bodies. You'd think the doctors killed enough people as it is without a buying them after they was dead. Don't you question the ways of providence, Matt Pedersen. You can't do it, Matt. You can't do it, Mother Slay. You stole that noise, Bob Plinties. Do you want to wake the poor girl upstairs? But you can't do it. This Cove Arnold, he knows her. Arnold knows who? He knows Peggy. Peggy Fair worships the ground he walks on. Oh. He set her arm once when Mother Slade broke it, accidental like, and she can't forget him. What's Arnold going to think when he opens up the sack and he finds What his... can Arnold do? He's bought her, ain't he? He can't go to the police and say he's bought her. Peggy. Peggy left. Don't do it, Mother Slade. Don't do it. And how do you two sickheads know what Mother Slade is going to do? You're going to kill her, ain't you? Peggy. Peggy Lester. I, I thought I heard her moving about upstairs. You did, Mr. Milk and Water. She's on the stairs now. Rob, you're the least to be depended on. Go out and fetch in the sack. Don't do it. It'll bring us all bad luck. Matt, you're a lad after me own heart. You stop where you are and do just as I tell you. Trim the candle. Let's have it all nice and snug. Mm. What'll she bring, do you think? Huh? Fifteen guineas. Huh? Maybe twenty. <laughs> Maybe more. Twenty guineas? Strike me blind. But this is a way of doing business that I like. Shh. Listen. Did you call me Mother Slave? That's right, my ducky. That's right, my little pet. Put your wrap around you and your slippers to keep your feet warm and come right down here to Mother Slade. I'm coming, Mother Slade. I'm coming. <laughs> in those times would be a surgeon and still be an honest man. At that drugged hour of the night, look into the sitting room of a spacious house. Many candles are still alight there, though they have burned down nearly to their silver sockets. There is Chinese paper on the walls and a turkey carpet underfoot. In front of the fire, now almost out, sits Dr. George Arnold, with his bottle green coat and heavy hair. Dr. Arnold, sir. Uh, I, 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 I beg your pardon, Mrs. Tancred. Dr. Arnold, sir. It's gone two o'clock. Yes, yes, oh yes, so it has. You've got a lecture to deliver tomorrow and you'll be all worn out. Why don't you go on up to bed? Mrs. Tancred. Yes, sir? You're a jewel of a housekeeper. I admire you and I can't do without you, but would you please go away and let me alone? Oh, sure, I'm very sorry, sir. No offense intended. Oh, stop. I, I shouldn't have said that. I'm uh, I'm thinking too much, perhaps. I'm smoking too many cigars, if you'll excuse me. Why must they keep tolling that bell at East Hill Church? Why must they keep it up all night? Well, sir, Elsie says the parson told them to do it. Elsie well, Wait. Who? Who is Elsie? Oh, Dr. Arnold, sir. I know you're always up in the clouds, mooning over books and whatnot, but I did think you'd recognize the name of your own parlor oh, maid. Oh, that Elsie. I see. Well? Elsie says it's because of the murder in the churchyard. What murder? Two resurrection men. Body snatchers, sir. 
Oh, you wouldn't know anything about such people. No, no. No, of course not. They were caught trying to rob a grave. But they got away. One of them was a horrible big fella. Spit Willie Kendrick's head open with the edge of a shovel. Is anything wrong, sir? No, no not exactly. Well, I thought for a second, seeing how you looked. Did they... Did they get the body? Yes, sir. It was Willie Kendrick. His head was split open with a shovel. No, no, I, I mean, did these resurrection men get what they were after? No, sir. Thank God. Oh, you may well say that, Doctor. Well, I wasn't exactly speaking in the religious sense, but never mind. What Elsie says, there are what she calls peelers all over the place. Peelers? Yes, these new policemen. After Sir Robert Peel. And somebody from the new detective police that they're using instead of the Bow Street Runners. Well, Mrs. Tancred, I'm going to smoke one more cigar and then I'm going to bed. Very good, sir. You see, sometimes you give orders, then it's too late to recall them. Whatever the medical practice is, you, you can't look your conscience in the face afterwards. Then, I can't tell you how or why, a miracle comes along and saves you, and you're free, you're... What was that? Sounds like a horse and cart in the drive, sir. Mrs. Tancred. Yes, Doctor. W will you please go upstairs? Now, make haste. Well, if it's visitors, sir, or even a patient... Mrs. Tancred, you heard my instructions. Obey them. Sir, there's the front door. Yes, I, I heard it. For the last time, go away. I will admit whatever visitors we have. Yes, sir. Good evening, dearie. Oh, come into the sitting room here, Miss... Uh, Mrs. Slade. No, sir. Just call me Mother Slade. You don't hardly seem natural or friendly to hear anything else. It's a pleasure to curtsy to you, Doctor. Coo, what a lovely room. I, I suppose... Your you... candles is going out, though. One by one. Poof. Then you'll be in the dark. I suppose you've come to report failure. Failure, dearie? I, I understand you didn't get what you went after. Bless you, dearie. We got something just as good. Finest piece of merchandise you ever saw. You haven't got it here. Bless you, dearie. Mother Slade always keeps her word. Bring the merchandise in, my dears, so the doctor can see it. Quiet, please. Oh, of course, dearie, I forgot. The big fella with the black eyebrows is Uncle Matt. The little fella with the watery eyes is Cousin Rob. And between them, in that sack, they're carrying... Well, who is it in the sack? Nineteen-year-old girl, dearie. Finest anatomical specimen you ever saw. Merciful Where heavens. you want this here thing dumped, Governor? Easy now, Matt. Why did you bring it here? That's where you told us to bring it, dearie. I, I mean, why did you bring it to the front door? Why not to the surgery? Only place in the house where there was lights, Governor. Hurry up now. Where do you want it? Well, take it... Yes, dearie? Take it over and put it in the cupboard there, where I'm pointing. This cupboard here, sir. Yes, then, then close the cupboard door. Shame on you two. Tracking your muddy boots over the doctor's lovely turkey carpet. Easy, my dears, easy now. All right, Robin. Don't bruise the merchandise. Whatever you do, don't bruise the merchandise. Right, me blind, what's the odds? She can't feel it now. There's your body, Mr. Sawbones. Now, let's see your money. Well, just one moment before I give it to you. There ain't no itch in this, is there? Uh, better not be. No, I I made a bargain with you and I'll stick to it. Thank you. That's uncommon genteel of you. Kindly stand back, sir. You're two stone of fat heavier than I am and you don't impress me. Easy, Matt. Take it easy. I, I want to ask only one question. Where did you get that body? That's a question, dearie, what people in your profession don't ask. Why not? Because they don't dare. That's why. Would the police be interested in where you got the body? No, dearie. Not half so interested in as where we brought it. To your house. It's your responsibility now. Yes, I suppose it is. The victim wouldn't be, by any chance, that... Pretty little girl you used to treat so unmercifully. You hold your noise about how I treated her. I was rather fond of Peggy. Oh, 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 oh. Strike me blind. I think the saw Oh, get out of this house, all of you. Go on, get out. Not without that money, dearie. It's 20 guineas now. There's money on the table under that newspaper. Take what you want, honey. Get out of here before I... 
Oh, what was that? Aye. What was it? A late visitor, I imagine. Was you expecting anybody? Eh? No. Don't drop the lovely money, Rob. Don't drop it all over the carpet. Pick it up. Is there a back way out of here? Yes, it's the way you should have come. Through that arch and, and down the passage. Thank you for the rhino, Governor. And no games, mind you, if you know what's good for you. Good night, dearie. Remember, you've got the body now. Yes. I've got the body now. Poor, poor little devil. Dr. Arnold, sir. In heaven's name, Mrs. Tancred, haven't you gone to bed yet? I had to get up, sir, to answer the oh, bell. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I, I'm sorry. Why, Dr. Arnold, what's the matter with you? Matter? You're as white as a ghost and you're almost crying. Am I? Well, we must remedy that. Oh, it's so dark in here, I could barely see you sitting there. The candles going out, one after another. Nothing but smoke and an ugly smell of grease and that cupboard door. What about that cupboard door? Oh, I always declare, sir, it won't keep shut without any latch or bolt. If you'll excuse the lip... Mrs. Tancred, keep away from that cupboard. Dr. Arnold, sir, are you ill or anything? No, but keep away from that cupboard. Who... who rang the bell? Oh, dear, I was almost forgetting. It's that man Elsie was talking to us about. What man? The officer of the detective police, sir. He wants to see you. Well, I'll see him, but in some other room. Not here. It's, it's as you say, there's not enough light. Uh, not a bit of it, Doctor. Not a bit of it. Never too dark, as you might say, where the police are concerned. Oh, I couldn't help it, sir. He must have followed me down the hall. Uh, are you... Uh, that's right, Doctor. I'm Stalker at your service. Inspector Stalker. Well, how do you do, Inspector? Mrs. Tancred, you may go. Oh. By your leave, sir. I'll just get some more candles and put them in that bracket by the cupboard. It's not in use. No, you needn't trouble. Oh, it's no trouble, sir. Excuse me. First of all, Doctor, I must apologize for intruding as late as this. Uh, not at all, Inspector. Will you be seated? Thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. Now, I dare say you're wondering why I'm here. Well, yes, I am, rather. It's a bad business, Doctor. A very bad business. You mean the... Murder in the churchyard. Oh, you've heard about it. Well, my housekeeper said something about a, a man being killed with a shovel. Well, that's right, Doctor. Not much doubt about who did that. No? No. The little fellow dropped his dark lantern with the initials on it. They're professional body snatchers. We've had our eye on them for a long time. Speaking of body snatchers, Doctor... Well... I expect this anatomy law is pretty hard in you, surgeons. It's an infamous law, sir. All the same, doctor, it is the law. Ye yes. And if any surgeon happened to be caught with a body, especially a murdered body... What are you, what are you hinting at? Oh, nothing, doctor, nothing. By your leave, I only want to ask a question. Well? What time did your friends leave? Now, come, Doctor. As one man of the world to another, do you see any green in my eye? You are not going to say you had no guests when their horse and cart are still at your front door. They didn't get away. No, Doctor, they didn't. They made a little reception committee as they left by the back door. Darby's on the wrists. Snap. Just as I might reach out and touch your wrist. Like this. What do you mean by Darby's? Handcuffs. I've got a pair in my pocket. Gags into their mouths. That's to keep them from biting. Look, do, do we have to go on with this? You, you already seem to know everything I could tell you. Not exactly everything. I don't know, for instance, where you've hidden the girl's body. You're a very diligent man, Inspector Stalker. Thank you, sir. I try to do my duty. You said a, a girl? These gin-muddled degenerates have been watched every second since they left East Hill Churchyard. They hadn't a body then, but they brought one here. And there's only one other person who lives in the same house with them. Dr. Arnold, sir. Mrs. Tancred, listen to me. Yes, sir. Must you always break in with the most completely ill-timed entrances at all the worst period of my life? I was only trying to be helpful, sir. That's right, madam. Always be helpful. You had to have some light. Here's the candles, sir. Five of them in a big candelabrum. We can hang them in the bracket. Ma'am, hold up that light. Hold it high. Really, sir? I'm not in the habit of being spoken to as... Hold though. it high, I tell you. Do as the inspector tells you, Mrs. Tancred. 
Mm, this is a very fine carpet you've got here, Doctor. Yes, others have admired it tonight. Mm, but it oughtn't to have footprints on it. Muddy footprints. Footprints leading from the door, past the sofa, past the half, over to... To that cupboard. Quite correct. I think that's done it, Dr. Arnold. I think it has, Inspector Stalker. Mm, we couldn't have proved anything against you for that churchyard business, but this... Let, let me open Bluebeard's cupboard, Inspector. Let me be the first to show you what's inside. You wanted a, a certain body. It appears you've come to the right place. Now, look. Lord Almighty. I'm the body, Mr. Police. Standing up, I'm very much alive. And I'm wearing a nice new dress that the doctor gave me. That I gave you? Don't say anything. Please don't say anything. Uh, stop a bit, miss. Aren't you Peggy Lester? Yes. Just because the doctor has to be so terribly respectable and a girl who's fond of him has to come here in secret. Wait a minute, everybody. Peggy Lester, you're lying. I am not lying. So that's it. Why didn't I guess it? It's the oldest body snatcher's trick in the world. Is it? Of course, the old pinch penny, like Mother Slade, couldn't sacrifice a good household grudge. Of course, they brought the body here, instead of taking it to the surgery, where it might get locked up. Could you be persuaded, Inspector, to, to tell us just what you're talking about? The body snatcher, sir. Well, what about them? They take a living accomplice and put him into a sack and sell him to a green doctor as a dead man. Yes, but see here, uh... They get the best price they can. Then in the middle of the night, that accomplice gets up and robs the doctor's house. And the doctor can't tell us because he's bought illegal goods. I never intended to go through with it. No, young woman? I tell you, I wasn't going to rob the house. They made me do this. I was going to tell Dr. Arnold. When I found out where they were taking me, I pretended to go through with it so I could warn the doctor. They can hurt so much, you'll agree to almost anything. Oh, that sounds like the truth, but it puts me in a funny position and no mistake. Well, your, your three murderers, Inspector, seem to, be, seem to be leaving. Yes, they're leaving right enough. Trussed up like fowls and under guard. Does anybody go with them? Well, how can anybody go with them? I'm willing to believe this girl acted under threats. She's committed no crime. And I don't for the life of me see how we can touch you. Can't touch me? No, sir. I confound you for making me lose a night's sleep. There's no body. We didn't, you didn't even buy a body. Will you tell me, doctor, just what crime you've committed? Hello, this is Tony Walker. I've only just interrupted the stories to suggest that you might want to join my mailing list. If you join my mailing list, you get an MP3 audiobook of my The Dalston Vampire with sound effects and an EPUB copy for you to read on your Kindle or whatever device you use. I use the list to keep in touch with my supporters. I email very infrequently, mostly because I forget. It's usually to let you know I've got a new book out or an audio book out. If that sounds like something you'd like to sign up for, just head over to the website www.ghostpod.org and follow the links to sign up to the mailing list. Sorry to interrupt. Normal service is now resumed. The Body Snatchers by John Dixon Carr Even though I didn't narrate that, and I didn't write it, uh, I wanted to say something about it like I normally do. So the first thing to say is something about John Dixon Carr. John Dixon Carr was born in 1906 in Pennsylvania in the United States. He lived in England and he married, married an English woman in the 1930s, returned back to the US in 1948, lived in New York State and, you know, was very, very prolific writer. I had a stroke in 1963, paralyzed down his left side, and he could only write with one hand. He'd stopped writing books by then, but he still did reviews of mystery and detective book reviews. Uh, and then he moved to Greenville in South Carolina and died in 1977. He, he wrote so many books. He had loads of series of books. His most famous probably were Dr. Fell, which I think is funny because uh, my mother was a Fell. It's not that common a name. It's a local name to us, really. 
But of course, in in the 1680s, there was a famous doctor fell in Oxford, and there was a, a, a rhyme written about him, written by Tom Brown in 1680. And it, it goes like this. I do not like thee, Dr. Fell. The reason why I cannot tell, but this I know and know full well. I do not like thee, Dr. Fell. Of course, I just quoted that poem because I like it. Dixon Carr's Dr. Fell has very little to do with that guy. He's a very genial, big guy. He wrote really lots and lots of novels, and he was considered one of the great stars of the golden age of the detective novel series. And he particularly specialised in locked room mysteries. So he had the amateur sleuth who decodes a, a, an impossible case whereby there was a locked room and it couldn't have been done, but he, in the end, turns around and tells you that, of course, it could be done and this is how. You know, you, you know the type. I think this story here, The Body Snatchers, he wrote a lot for this series, Suspense, which is an American series, even though the actors in it are English. And there wasn't there was a UK version of this. I think this came out oh in the nineteen forties, nineteen forty one, I want to say. I think it's a neat little story. So what happens is, in summary, we, we have a setup whereby we have the evil mother slade waiting uh, in the cottage by ones with common hearing the church bells. So that creates a suspense and we're told that she's awaiting the body snatchers coming back who are her family members, and we're also introduced to Peggy, the young girl who she mysteriously is giving a home for because she doesn't seem to have a nice bone in her body, old mother Slade. So what is this lovely girl, Peggy, uh, doing there? I wanted to just comment on the accents, how it's acted. The, the, the rogues are all cockneys, working class cockneys, and the heroes are all nicely middle class spoken. Even Peggy, who you would presume would be working class, it, uh, doesn't speak like a cockney. And the housemaid, Mrs. Tancred, is a lot better spoken as well. So, you know, I, I think um, in, in America, it, it seems to me that the big, and I've realised I'm talking to an audience which isn't just American or British. So uh, every country has its own way of slicing the cake. But race is a really big deal in America uh, about the divisions. And, and, and it's not not in the UK, but um, the big division, of course, is the class system. And we mark that by our accents, which is... Yeah, well, is why one of the reasons why I can do different accents because when I was a little boy, I had I was basically bilingual. Um, I spoke pretty strong Maryport Cumbrian dialect when, when I was out and about with my friends, and then when I came home to to where my mum had married um, a guy who who didn't speak like that, um, it was literally knocked out of me if I spoke in dialect. It would hit me. So uh, there you go. Now don't be all sad about this. This he, he didn't brutalize me. It was just normal, you know. A normal way of disciplining people, and I've I've come out of it quite well. So listen, I'm not looking for a company, and this isn't a, a snivelling whine. It's just saying that that's that's how it was done. So I think because of that, I learned to listen and to modify my voice, and I still do it. I still do it. And when I'm at work, if I'm talking to a consultant uh, or a, a doctor, I will tend to speak l less northern. If I'm speaking to a patient who is uh, you know economically and socially not doing too well. Uh, and would tend to speak stronger dialects just the way it is, uh, I will speak in dialect with them, you know. And I did that in Wales as well. The, the Welsh, of course, the split isn't a class system, in Welsh-speaking Wales anyway. It's um, a linguistic one, so you, there are clues to if someone speaks Welsh, you may begin speaking English, and then if you ascertain they're probably a Welsh speaker, you'll you'll attempt a sentence in Welsh, and they will, you know, or or something like that, you know. On the night, Tinkamraig, you know, they would say, "Are you a Welsh? Are you a Welshy?" Uh, and so, I mean, I don't mean to be offensive by saying Welshy. The people get offended about so many things. Don't be offended. I never mean to offend anybody, really, even about murdering dogs. I, I really don't. I've never murdered a dog in my life. Anyway, just stop being so offended about stuff. Just chill out. Anyway, so getting back to this story, it's a nice setup. We have the suspense, and then we have a flashback to them being caught in the in the graveyard. They they are they're going for a young girl, and the doctor has paid for a young girl, but they don't get the corpse, the corp, as uh, Mother Slade says, because they're surprised. Now that's a setup for the next bit. So the next bit is the evil people. They like the money. They've been promised. Yeah, we're going to have to murder the girl upstairs. Now remember, we know what happens later on. We know that they don't murder the girl upstairs. We know that um, actually 
what happens is she is supposed to be there, plant who gets in, into the doctor's house and then robs it. So that is the first setup. The first twist is that the corpse is not the corpse that we think he thinks it is. And it in fact is a girl that he quite liked and who quite liked him. So that's a switch. And, and that we, we go forward to the doctor. And know, we know that. I'm going to remind you of this kind of three categories of knowledge. First of all, there is a situation where the protagonist, and I guess the protagonist or the hero in this is the doctor, he knows as much as we do. That is that is standard. Then we have where the narrator knows more than us, and that is the unreliable narrator, Roger Ackroyd, of course. Agatha Christie is the famous one, but there are plenty now. And the third one is where we know more than the protagonist, and that leads to a sense of suspense. So we know that the doctor or we think we know, that's the twist. We think we know the doctor's going to be tricked. So we go with a sense of suspense. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And when we see the muddy muddy uh, paw prints, I was going to say, when the muddy footprints and the copper is being led, who sounds like John Gielgud. I don't think it is, but it sounds like John Gielgud. is being led to the cupboard. We think, oh, no. And as far as we know, there's a corpse in there because we haven't been told otherwise. And the doctor seems pretty cool about this, pretty sanguine about the whole thing. And he opens the door and out pops Peggy large as life. And she says, it's the only way you can, a girl can get to see the doctor. And we're a bit sweet on each other. So the first twist is the doctor's tricked. We think that he's not getting the corpse he bought and he's getting his lover instead. The second twist is she isn't the corpse and that the plan was that she would, you know, which we've not been privy to. So that's a bit sneaky of the writer. Maybe we've had that withheld from us. Here she pops up, she's supposed to rob him. And then the third twist is she isn't going to rob him. She never was because she loves him. And the fourth twist is there's no crime committed, even though it looks pretty criminal all the way along. But at the end, actually, there is no crime committed. So he, he does this. Oh, Henry does this a lot as well. You know, you, you set things up and then you knock them down. You set them up and you knock them down. And the more twists you can get in, the more gratifying it is, but the harder it is to do and the more artificial it can seem. So in this sense, there is no hint at all in the discussion that would lead us to believe that the girl is going to be alive and is intended to be a robber. And I think that's, that feels not quite fair to us as the listener. Um, so I think that's a little bit of a flaw, but it, fair play to him. He got a load of twists put in there. And the doctor's behaviour is, is not massively, I'm not sure, you know, he talks about, he kind of suspects it might be Peggy. He says something about that. and But he opens the cupboard, not as, oh God, well, copper, you got me bang or peeler, she says, you got me bang to rights. Not that at all. He's like, yeah, okay, here we go. And he's fairly upbeat about it. And apparently he doesn't know. And then I'm like, well, does he know? So, okay, it's an, in, and he did all that in half an hour. How about that? So it's a good story and fun, but not unflawed. But who am I to say? This guy wrote so many books. He was so well regarded that it's not for me to criticize, but I just did anyway. Because everybody criticizes everybody, you know, everybody's offended, everybody's critical. Funnily enough, the Winter Olympics are on now because it's actually the end of February, well, last week of February 2022. I like to give a timestamp to these things now because otherwise people people say, I hope you enjoyed your birthday. And I'm like, what? You know, and they've been listening to one from March 20, that's a clue when my birthday is, 2022. And it's actually 2025 in August, you know. And so now I'm timestamping this end of Feb 2022. The Winter Olympics are going on. Let's hope there isn't a war. Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, let's, that's a downer. So let's talk about the Winter Olympics. And there's a sport of curling, which is a big deal in, in Scotland. And nobody really knows much about, particularly if you're not Scots, you don't know much about curling. And even most Scots don't really. And yet everybody becomes an expert while the Winter Olympics. And we're giving advice to these people who've done nothing but play curling all their lives. And we've never done it. We've never even heard of it before now. And two weeks in, we're like, you fool, why did you do that? You know, and it's, I feel a bit like me now saying to old John Dixon Carr, who seems a nice guy, there's a lovely picture of him on the internet. He seems very genial looking. And telling him, well, you know, I think your story structure is a bit, I mean, he's saying, Tony, mate, he wouldn't say it like that. Tony, mate, you know, get back in your box. So fair enough, I'll get back in my box. Hope you're all well. Listen, this is an, an experiment, putting somebody's stuff up. YouTube may strike me down for copyright. I, I think it is out of copyright. You might not like it. Let me know. Let me know in the comments what you think. Okay. 
and uh, I'll be back with the normal normal routine of stories that I narrate or even that I write in due course. All right. Happy February. Enjoy the curling, but you know, but don't don't shout at the TV.